Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Columbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Jim, so far, I hope you're having a super Tuesday. Just a terrific, terrific super <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> In fact, it is Super Tuesday uh, for the Democrats. There's actually Republican voting, I think, going on in some of these states, but uh, we already know how that's going to turn out. So uh, the the Democrats are the ones we're watching today. 14 uh, different states. Uh, The biggest delegate prize is California and Texas, but 14 states, including where we live here in Virginia. Uh, Also, we should point out Tennessee voting today. And our thoughts are certainly with our our friends and others in Tennessee who are uh, picking up the pieces following those horrific tornadoes that went through the Nashville area. Uh, Jim, we have a very busy day today in the, on the Three Martini Lunch, so grab a stool, and, uh, and, and Jim, let's get into our bad, crazy, and crazy martinis. No good ones today. We'll start with uh, the bad. Uh, last night was the unity rally for the Democrats in Dallas. Uh, obviously, as I just mentioned, Texas won the big delegate prizes. Biden seeming to surge there, which could make a huge difference in, in the delegate hall tonight. And uh, not only was Biden there campaigning, but he brought in two of his recently vanquished rivals that are now on his side, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar. And Jim, if he had just done that, it probably would have been OK for him. But the biggest problem that you have in politics is when you go that extra mile just to try and put the icing on the cake, and he had to bring in Beto, too. Beto had been gone, forgotten, off the front page, but uh, he was in Beto form last night. Here's the uh, very end of Beto's comments, and most importantly, what Biden had to say when he took the microphone back. Ladies and gentlemen, el próximo presidente de los Estados Unidos, Joe Biden! Let's do it for Joe. I want to make something clear. I'm going to guarantee you this is not the last year seen of this guy. You're going to take care of the gun problem with me. You're going to be the one who leads this effort. I'm counting on you. I'm counting on you. We need you badly. The state needs you. The country needs you. You're the best. Oh, he's the best, really, when it comes to guns? Well, uh, I think you all remember this, but this is back from September in the debate. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. We're not going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore. Jim, I don't know why the Democrats always uh, plead with us to let them be clear, but uh, I think Joe Biden was pretty clear last night. Uh, He might not be the most famous gun grabber in this race, but that's certainly his intention. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was, uh, you didn't play the secondary audio there uh, right afterwards, Greg, when Beto added, hell yes, we're going to take away your positive momentum from this ceremony. (laughs) If necessary, I will go house to house and I will discourage Democrats who thought Biden might not be that bad on the gun issue because he once said, let's go out and fire a shotgun in the random directions (laughs) to protect your house. I'd, I'd ask you to get that audio, Greg, but we have a million clips for today's show. We do. Yeah. Oh, yes. I would go house to house to discourage people to vote for you. Yeah. Everything was looking great. You know, Klobuchar was out. Buttigieg was out. You, they, they were coming together, forming this, like, Democratic establishment Voltron. You know, pieces <laughs> were coming into place. I've already seen the uh, the mock-up of the movie poster of Weekend at Bernie's, which, by the way, like, it's a shame that Bernie is, Bernie Sanders is named Bernie because you can't use that metaphor. Of you know the, the two other ones holding up the, the the deceased Bernie as you know basically Biden playing the role of Bernie and Klobuchar and, and Buttigieg trying to make it look like he's still alive. Yeah, it was going so well. And then Beto had to show up. Currently, the, the interesting possibility that Beto O'Rourke is actually some sort of like like ant, he's like a talisman of bad luck. <laughs> I, I think the dog on the cover of Vanity Fair was trying to warn us: nothing good comes from bringing Beto O'Rourke on board. Um, because first of all, that will play in in you know if, if Biden is the nominee, you are probably not going to get that many gun owners or people who really care about the Second Amendment voting for the Democrat to begin with. Um, but that'll be used at the Democratic nomination. The NRA, I'm sorry, that'll be used at the, the Republican nomination. That'll play at the NRA convention. This will be a big part of the message that no matter what else Biden says, he's made very clear he's on board with the Beto position. And I, you know, every once in a while, when I point to that Beto quote. People will say, Jim, he doesn't stand for all Democrats. Well, there you go. There's Biden on board. And when Beto said that at that debate, Greg, I don't remember anyone, remember anyone vote booing. No, nobody nobody contradicted him, I don't think. I think Biden has said at times that it was unrealistic. So it be kind of interesting to see how, how this goes from here. He was obviously doing a bit of pandering here. But uh, now we've got the clip, and uh, now he's pretty much committed to it. I was going to say, you know, sometime between that comment and now, it became realistic, I guess. <laughs> 
as soon as he thought that it would help. Uh, don't forget that uh, Joe Biden in another debate uh, said he's absolutely committed to banning fracking and uh, doesn't find it all that concerning that those jobs are going to disappear because we'll find something in the renewable yeah, energies I mean, like the and so forth. The only upside for, for nominating Biden is anytime he says something like that, you know, the rest of the party can lean forward and say, Grandpa's having a moment. Don't worry, he's not going to do it. <laughs> Speaking of grandpa moments, Joe had a couple of them yesterday. First of all, he encouraged everyone to get out and support him on Super Thursday. But uh, he quickly corrected that one. But then he was talking about uh, the Declaration of Independence. I think this has made its uh, rounds pretty effectively on social media. But here it is again. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the go, you know the, you know the thing. The thing, you know, the thing that uh, stated our separation from England back in the year, whatever that was. Uh, Jim, do you think the Democrats are ready for eight months of this now that they've all decided Biden's their guy? I I was going to say, I feel like they kind of underestimated the the, the cost of this. Like, there was a reason Iowa and New Hampshire turned against Biden pretty quickly uh, as soon as the, the votes came. You know, look, we, we had a whole bunch of debates. Biden was the front runner for most of 2019. And then right around the end of the year, right as people really started tuning in, all of a sudden became a sense of like, hey, you know what? Biden's kind of old. He's, he's kind of forgetful. He, you know. And again, we can go back and forth on how serious it is. You and I had noticed there, like a couple of debates ago, he had one where the words really, he was mispronouncing words. It really came off odd. Didn't happen in the last debate. There are days where Biden is more sharp and on the ball and, and mentally acute or whatever other you know description you want to use. And then there are times where it's bad. And when he couldn't remember God, <laughs> that's it. that's a really kind of unnerving one. That's one of the ones where, you know, if it was football, you'd have him sit out a few plays while you run a concussion check. Well, it'll be interesting to see. Some folks have said now that the field has winnowed, if there are more Democratic debates and it's basically down to three or four people, he's going to have to talk a lot more than when the stage was a lot more crowded. And obviously, if he's the nominee, he's going to have to go for about 90 minutes one on one with President Trump. So uh, we'll see if he's up to that challenge. Anyway, let's move on to our first crazy. And for that, we head over to MSNBC. Chris Matthews has been a fixture at MSNBC for a very long time, just celebrated 20 years of hosting Hardball, I think, late last year. But in the last few weeks, things have started to pile up for poor Chris, and uh, he's now out of a job there. Uh, a couple of uh, moments in recent weeks just covering politics definitely were cringeworthy. At least on the left, this one raised a few eyebrows and a lot of outrage, where after Elizabeth Warren went after Mike Bloomberg in a debate over his non-disclosure agreements, uh, Chris Matthews uh, questioned her about why she instinctively believed the woman rather than Bloomberg. How can you actually trust someone who will not just say, look, I'm going to wave on non-disclosure on sexual harassment and discrimination nomination. Yeah. Anybody who has a story to tell can come tell. Sure, I agree story. with everybody deserves a credible response when they make a, a, a charge like that. My question about him, you believe he's lying. I believe the woman. You believe he's which lying. Which means he's not telling the truth. And why would he lie? Because just to protect himself. Yeah. And why would she lie? And that triggered a column in GQ where Matthews was accused of making inappropriate comments to a particular guest in the green room in the makeup chair at Hardball over the years. Uh, Then uh, during I think this was during a Trump rally last week while they were watching Lindsey Graham stand next to Tim Scott. Matthews was interviewing Jamie Harrison, who's the Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate against Lindsey Graham this year. And this is really cringeworthy, Jim, because Matthews confuses Tim Scott and Jamie Harrison. Jamie, I see you standing next to the guy you're going to beat right there, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Lindsey Graham. Tim Scott. Tim Scott. (laughs) Jamie? Tim Scott. Who's that? That's Tim Scott. I'm sorry. Oh, it's the the other senator, Tim Scott. What am I saying? Big mistake. Mistaken identity, sir. Sorry. Oh, boy. And anyway, so last night, Matthews opens the show like this. Let me start with my headline tonight. I'm retiring. This is the last hardball on MSNBC. And obviously, this isn't for lack of interest in politics. As you can tell, I've loved every minute of my 20 years as host of Hardball. Every morning I read the papers and I'm gung-ho to get to work. Not many people have had this privilege. And then he also addressed the allegations that have been uh, floating out there, of course, about those inappropriate comments. A lot of it has to do with how we talk to each other. Compliments on a woman's appearance that some men, including me, might have once incorrectly thought were okay. 
were never okay. Not then and certainly not today. And for making such comments in the past, I'm sorry. So, Jim, Matthews has been a colorful character over the years. We all uh, got a good chuckle out of the tingle during the Obama years and so forth. But uh, is Matthews a, a Me Too casualty or a guy who's just passed his due date in terms of hosting a show here? Well, I was going to say it, it's very odd because it feels like these two fact the, the two factors are coming into confluence, and there's one reason that MSNBC would like to emphasize, and perhaps one reason MSNBC would like to not emphasize. In addition to look, you and I have fumed about Chris Matthews for for a very long time. Everybody, you know, it's not really that he's on the left. Everybody knew if he worked for for Tip O'Neill for lots of years. You know, if you want to be a left of center, fine. I think one of my favorite aspects of Chris Matthews' career was that he came out with a book that uh, about John F. Kennedy that, that really made the term hagiography, hey, where you see how much I read words, but I don't <laughs> hear them. Um, it was a gushing biography of John F. Kennedy. And it came out like a month before the woman came forward and said that, yes, as a 19-year-old intern, I was having sex with John F. Kennedy in the White House. And that book just disappeared. <laughs> And Matthews just stopped talking about it. And it was just kind of this, you know, one ill timing, but just kind of this sense that Chris Matthews' idea of who the Democrats were and what they stood for was really romanticized. And he did not like, um, there, there was just, there were ugly parts of the portrait that he just did not want to focus upon. When the first Me Too scandals came along, there were a bunch of anecdotes about this. Nothing in the long, along the lines of, of inappropriate touching or anything like that, but just a sense of, Chris Matthews liked to discuss women's appearances, and that rubbed a lot of women the wrong way. And I don't think you have to, I don't think these women are necessarily too sensitive or, or you know, uh, you know, whining over nothing or something like that. You know, if you're a woman who's appearing on hardball, you want to be treated the same way your male colleagues are. And you may or may not like the idea of Chris Matthews going on at length about how good looking you are and all that stuff. I've seen other people characterizing it as flirting. Greg, I am the wrong guy to determine the appropriateness of Chris Matthews flirting with you. <laughs> I, I would just say that that holds no appeal to me. And if women find the idea of Chris Matthews flirting with them completely unappealing, women of America, I stand with you. Um, but the interesting thing is you know, that you know, we'd heard these stories before. And for whatever reason, MSNBC said, OK, you know, he, we gave him a talking to. He's not going to do it again. We don't feel a need for him to step down. Couple, you know, last couple of weeks, it's been very clear. Chris Matthews has no interest in Bernie Sanders being the nominee of the Democratic Party. I think he thinks that there's really no chance that he beats Donald Trump. But I think he also believes that what Bernie Sanders stands for is bad for the country, that he is an out, you know, not really out and out socialist, but that throughout his career, Bernie Sanders has been at minimum um, sympathetic to uh, communist regimes or, or maybe, you know, at minimum soft peddling the horrors of communist regimes. And seeing them as an acceptable trade-off. You know, we're going to set up a police state, but we're going to increase the literacy rate by 20 percentage points. So in the end, it all balances out. He went off on this odd tangent that Chris Matthews said that during the, you know, the Cold War, if the communists had taken power, people like me would have been taken, to, uh, taken out to Central Park and shot. Now, although it was kind of, it was very odd because, first of all, this is something that, like those of us who are who are deep rooted conservatives believe that at the heart of conserv at the heart of communism, is this idea of we represent the will of the people. Anyone who disagrees with us is an enemy of the people, and anyone who disagrees with us must be liquidated like the kulaks, right? That it is you know it was straight up out of the ABC miniseries America, or if you want to watch this really creepy. Uh, opening montage of a video game, Homefront, is this video game that came out. It imagined a North Korean takeover of the United States. Not terribly likely. Kind of like that remake of Red Dawn. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, the authoritarian groups take power and they begin executing Americans who have the audacity to stand against them, right? Bernie Sanders, whatever his flaws, has not called for executions of prominent Americans in Central Park. That having been said, Greg, if Chris Matthews' sudden resignation may indicate he wants to be nowhere near Central Park for at least the next 18 months or so to wow. avoid the Sanders death squads. And so, so here's my suspicion. I think MSNBC was uncomfortable with how vehemently Chris Matthews was denouncing Bernie Sanders. They know that their audience is heavily Democratic, and there's a big chunk of the Democratic base that loves Bernie Sanders and that is up in all... Like, the Bernie Sanders campaign is convinced that MSNBC is less fair to them than Fox News is. I... Don't quite see it that way, but fine, whatever. 
they've decided that Chris Matthews is an enemy, and I think they have claimed one of their first scalps by getting rid of, uh, by effectively, whatever happened in the last 24 to 48 hours. Because you could tell from Kornacki and everybody else at MSNBC, nobody expected that to happen yesterday. Kornacki looked like, you know, he'd seen somebody get shot. And the, the, the reaction there indicates this was a last-minute decision by Chris Matthews. Something changed in the last 24 to 48 hours. And if we don't hear about, you know, some other, God forbid, some other harassment scandal or something like that, I think it indicates that the Bernie, you know, forces at MSNBC made it uncomfortable enough where, where Chris Matthews was like, you know what, they don't want me around here anymore. I'm going to leave. Would have been nice if he could actually finish his last show instead of just <laughs> cutting to Steve Kornacki and making him finish the show. But uh, nonetheless, uh, he is done. Uh, I think this is probably going to trigger a larger conversation because I see some folks on social media saying, well, this is just proof that you can never compliment a woman on her appearance again. And, you know, two guys here uh, discussing whether what's appropriate and what's not might not be the best forum for that. The good news, Jim, is that you and I are both happily married, so we don't really have to worry about that too much. But uh, I can see it being an awkward situation for some people out there. Look, Greg, what are the things we don't like talking about? Home furnishings and women's apparel. We don't even like having opinions on them. That's probably the safest opinion to have at this point. All right, on to our second crazy martini, our third martini of the day. And, of course, uh, Jim, it is Super Tuesday. Lots of delegates at stake. And in case you haven't noticed, uh, with all the Democrats coalescing around Biden, uh, Trump and some of his allies have been out there very brazenly on Twitter and elsewhere saying, oh, the coup is on, the knives are out for Bernie, so forth and so on. And uh, Donna Brazil was asked about this, and she was first asked to respond to comments made by RNC chairwoman, Ronna McDaniel, formerly Ronna Romney McDaniel. I guess it still is, but I shouldn't use the Romney anymore. Probably a good move right now in Republican circles. <laughs> but uh, the beginning of this clip is the uh, end of the Romney clip. And then Sandra Smith of Fox News asked Donna Brazil, who's now a Fox News contributor and a former DNC chairwoman, to respond. And, uh, well, Donna brought her four-letter words with her. It does depend on how big the lead that Sanders takes out of California is, if he picks up a, a huge proportion of delegates. But I don't see anybody getting out soon, and it's leading towards potentially a broker convention, which will uh, be rigged against Bernie if those superdelegates have their way on that second vote. To that, you say what, Donna? First of all, I, I want to talk to my Republicans. First of all, stay the hell out of our race. Stay the hell out of our race. I get sick and tired, Ed. Uh, and Sandra, of listening to Republicans tell me and the Democrats about our process. So then she goes on to say that the Republicans are canceling some primaries this year, and in a normal year, uh, they have winner take all, so it's not as balanced and fair as a Democratic primary. And then Brazil goes off again. And for people to use Russian talking points to sow division among Americans, that is stupid. So, Rana, go to hell. This oh, is wow. not about... No, go to hell. I'm tired of it, Ed. We're not, we're not trying to prevent anyone from becoming the nominee. If you have the delegates and win, you will win. This notion that somehow or another Democrats are out there trying to put hurdles or roadblocks before one candidate, that's stupid. No, it's true. But uh, they still have to win the delegates. But, uh, Jim, this would be a more compelling argument if she hadn't been slipping debate questions to Hillary Clinton four years ago. What do you make of uh, Donna's supposedly righteous indignation? Yeah, I mean, the first question is, um, I, I agree with, with everything you said there. You know, it might be fair to ask. So if she's already demonstrated that as a uh, analyst on a cable news network, she will violate trust to help one candidate, why does she have a Fox News contract? By that standard, it's good that Fox News doesn't have a uh, debate for, for the Democrats. Look, the first reason we would think that the Democratic, Par Democratic National Committee would be putting their thumb on the scale or otherwise favoring one candidate or another is we can look to primary sources like mm, Donna Brazile's autobiography, <laughs> where she lays out, and oh, by the way, all the emails that got hacked, you know, even if they were wrongly done by the... The emails that were from the DNC demonstrated the DNC was not only like pull, lots of people were pulling for Hillary Clinton by itself. That's not that big a deal. Everybody in a Democratic you know, organization is going to have an opinion over. I like this candidate more than that candidate. It is probably fair to say there were not a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters at the DNC. And one of the few was Tulsi Gabbard, uh, who then resigned from the DNC so she could endorse uh, Sanders. But also the fact that you know Hillary Clinton had decided to pay for the DNC's Democratic National Committee's debt in the 2016 cycle, when basically and then promptly put the committee on a um, on a on a basically an allowance, you could say. By the way, all of this is Donna Brazile's autobiography. <laughs> this is something. This is, this is like literally she told us about all of this. 
Um, and this is a you know an example of how the DNC was playing favorites. Now, is there much evidence that they're playing favorites in this one? I don't quite think so. I think it's just generally a more general lament of incompetence uh, by Tom Perez and the disorganization of the Iowa Democratic Party in the general sense that the debate schedule has not helped anyone. The debate standards have simultaneously been too hard for the long shot candidates and created such a cacophony of noise on the debate stage that uh, it doesn't really help any of the candidates. There's just a general sense of DNC incompetence this cycle. I think it's less that. But on this whole, you know, go to hell and, and all that stuff, it's interesting to see this this tone come from, from Donna Brazil. There's an old saying, when the facts are on your side, argue the facts. When the law is on your side, argue the law. And when neither the facts nor the, the law are on your side, pound the table. I think that's the kind of answer you go with, we, we've seen there from Donna Brazil. But also, I think it's interesting, look, Bernie Sanders supporters have seen this happen once before. They are understandably suspicious of every Democratic Party decision that's going to come down the pike. And it's very clear that the establishment, which may or may not overlap with the Democratic National Committee, very much doesn't want Bernie Sanders to be the nominee. So that's why the hairs in the back of their neck are standing up. So it is kind of interesting. I think this kind of tone of how dare you accuse of this does not do anything to dispel suspicions amongst the Bernie Sanders supporters. Jim, uh, regardless of what anybody thinks of the president, I'd forgotten how much fun it is to uh, really not have a race when uh, there is a Republican <laughs> incumbent to watch uh, the Democrats have all the stress. We haven't really had it since 2004 and before that, 1984, both of which turned out pretty well for the Republicans. But uh, just being able to sit back for a few months and, and watch all the, the knife fighting come out, is, uh, it's kind of fun. Demolition Derby. So you're going to stay up uh, all night tonight and find out uh, who gets every last delegate? I will be up well into the night, uh, blogging and tweeting, writing up a summary for NRO and all that kind of stuff. So if you're up, go ahead. If not, just check it tomorrow morning. <laughs> the good news is most of them are primaries, so we should have results, you know, sometime this week. So that's that's good news. Yeah, California, like, you know, sometime by April, I think. <laughs> yeah, they're going to have a few probably million uh, mail-in ballots that everybody's got to rip open, get to treat the paper cuts, tally the, the votes and everything. So it's going to take a little while out there. But uh, anyway, I'm sure everyone will just wait patiently until then and not point a lot of fingers. So, uh, Jim, see, huh. see you tomorrow. <laughs> Look, if you can't trust the California Democratic Party, who can you trust? <laughs> Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Leave us a kind review. Also, uh, don't forget about those home devices, Alexa, Google Home, things like that. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast, and you can hear us right away. And join us on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.